we bless it and we call it good. We let God take control. We bless, we bless it and watch the blessings flow. Well, good morning again, Celebration Spiritual Center. How are we feeling? Are we aware? Are we awake? Are we alive? Yes, yes. Beautiful. So I'm watching the time because we want to end on time because we have so much more fun in store for us. So I, I, I don't intend to be before you too long, um, but we're going to jump in. We are in our series, The Superhero's Journey. Looking at the hero's journey as it's been taught to us and brought to us through Joseph Campbell's work, which is really awesome. I invite you to get the book, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, if you don't have that. Um, also, uh, Netflix just added The Power of Myth to Netflix, which I'm so excited about. It's so cool. Because um, it really hasn't been available. You couldn't stream it anywhere. So um, if you haven't seen that, I invite you to watch it, particularly the first episode, which is The Hero's Adventure. So in week one, we started with Think Like a Hero, and I took us to the very first movie in the Avengers saga, which is Captain America, the first Avenger. And what we looked at was the life of Steve Rogers, how he exemplifies something very beautiful for us, that he was skinny, he was weak, he was sickly, and yet he was the one that was selected to become this super soldier. And what it tells us is something about life is that we're waiting to become the hero of our story. We're waiting to um, show up and be great and amazing in the world. But the way we do that is first we have to start thinking like a hero. See, he embodied, his character displayed all of the wonderful, beautiful, powerful attributes of the hero before his body manifested in that. And of course, we recognize this is how life works. It's as within, so without. So we have to think like a hero and then the opportunities show up for us then to become the hero of our own story. Last week and week two initiated into greatness. We stayed with the Captain America story, but we went to the third movie in his, in his saga, Civil War. And of course, this is the movie that introduces us to then Prince T'Challa, uh, AKA the Black Panther. And what we talked about there is this idea of sometimes we think we're being tested and, and we think that uh, uh, something outside of us is maybe mad at us and, and punishing us. But what this is, this stage in the hero's journey is called the belly of the whale. And what we find is that really every character is in the belly of the whale, but particularly T'Challa was unknowingly, he was thrown in the belly of the whale the moment that his father was killed. Because everything changed for him. Now he's not just the Black Panther standing at his father's side, but he now must become the king of a country, Wakanda. We also see that motif and the symbolism of being in the, in the belly of the whale. It shows up again even um, near the end of the story when we see Steve Rogers and, and Tony Stark having their moment of disagreement. They're in Siberia in another pit, in the depths, in the belly of the whale, which is uh, actually breaking up their friendship, but it's also putting them in a path um, to begin another path or another path of their journey. The other thing that T'Challa is learning in this movie, as he's in the belly of the whale, he, he wants to avenge his father's death, but ultimately he comes to this beautiful realization that vengeance is not what works, that it'll consume him. And we see that embodied in the character of the main uh, villain, Helmut Zemo, who was consumed um, by this anger and was consumed by trying to avenge the death of his family. And so uh, T'Challa realizes that I can't let this consume me anymore. And so that is sort of, the signal of him uh, realizing the, the lesson, if you will, and now he can move on to become the king of Wakanda. And so then this takes us to this year, February of this year, one of the most amazing movies ever was released, right? And it's interesting to think, but that was this year, y'all, that was February, Black Panther. Um, and it's done some amazing things. It has grossed over $1.3 billion worldwide. It is now the third highest grossing film ever in the United States, the ninth highest grossing film worldwide, and it is the highest grossing film ever by an African American director. How many people have seen The Black Panther? In the theater, you saw it at least once. Hands up if you saw it twice. <laughs> Hands up if you saw it three times. Hands up if you saw it four times. In the theater. Hands up if you saw it five times. In the theater. <laughs> Okay, so six is the highest. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. And so we recognize that this movie did something to all of us, right? 
And, and you know, we already, many of, many of us who had been following the Marvel saga, we already loved um, T'Challa and we loved the Black Panther, but we met so many other new characters. Early in the movie, we meet Okoye, and we meet Nakia, right? Or maybe I know some of you, your favorite character is M'Baku. Hey! <laughs> For so many different reasons. <laughs> Of course, you may love our sister Shuri, who was amazing. Yeah. She was really, yeah. And then some of us love Eric Stevens, AKA Killmonger. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, okay, all right. All right. <laughs> and while I love all of these characters, I must say that my favorite character in the movie never utters a word. My favorite character in the movie, actually, the fate of this character is hung in the balance through the entire story. It's actually, we're introduced to this character at the very beginning. Because in the opening of the film, we get that wonderful animated sequence and we have Prince Njobu speaking to his son, Eric Stevens, telling him the origin story of Wakanda. He tells us how Wakanda came to be, he tells us about the power of vibranium and, and how vibranium enriched the country, and he tells us why this great country has to be protected and has been isolated from the outside world. Wakanda is my favorite character. It's the character that never speaks, but yet its fate hangs in the balance from the beginning to the end of the film. Because I recognize the power of the, this character, Wakanda. See, it's Wakanda that changed us. I remember after I saw the movie for the first time, I looked at Pasolana and I said, my DNA is different. My cells are different as a result of watching this movie. It, it's Wakanda that made us proud. It's Wakanda that sparked our imagination. It's Wakanda that's not just an aspirational or fictitious country, but it's the celebration of the beauty and the brilliance of the African diaspora. Because we see every region, we see every culture, we see every tribe represented, not just in East Africa, but also West Africa. The entire continent is represented in Wakanda. It represents the beauty of Africanness, yes. as it has been portrayed all across the planet. Yes. And so it awakens something deep within our psyche. It awakens something deep within our consciousness. So today I say Wakanda forever. <laughs> yes, yes. It's so beautiful. I, um, I went for a float on um, Friday, and um, the sister that was there that, that was helping me and showing me to the float room, just she looked at me, she was like, what kind of forever? <laughs> just like, <laughs> it's so cool, right? And so I love how that happens, right? It's just, it's become a part of our consciousness. So Wakanda, as my favorite character and as the hero of the story and true, as with all heroes, it tells us something about ourselves. Again, as, as I think back to the opening, uh, as we have that beautiful opening sequence um, where Njobu is telling the story of Wakanda, it reminds me of the stories we tell about ourselves. Because while we can first, if you watch the story for the first time and hear it, it brings up pride. But when you really examine it, you're also seeing, it's showing us something problematic. Because we see how, while Wakanda was protected and isolated, what was happening all around the world. Wakanda had the possibility to actually support and, and sustain or help to make the world better, but to protect this beautiful thing that they are and to protect the vibranium, um, uh, they, they remained isolated. And so many times I recognize that for us, we tell the story about ourselves, oh, I'm this way because of something that happened back in the day. Right? And we justify our behaviors for now. In the same way that the story is justifying the isolation of Wakanda. Um, many times, some of us have been taught or we believe that the world is a scary place. So this is why we say stay, stay, stay safe and isolated or we protect ourselves and only live in a familiar condition. This is the same thing we see in the story of the Wizard of Oz. It's another hero's journey, right? Where Dorothy was just living in this safe, protected space um, with, with, with Aunt M, right? And, and unwilling to venture out, scared to go out. Um, I, I love in The Wiz, of course, um, where Aunt Em is like, you've never been south of 125th Street. <laughs> and on one level, Dorothy 
could justify in the same way that Wakanda, that the origin story of Wakanda justifies, well, there's a reason why we, why I'm doing that. I'm actually able to thrive, and everybody here looks like me, and Harlem is wonderful, and don't you know about the Harlem Renaissance? Right? You could go on and on and justify, but we recognize that there was something she had, had to learn about herself, of who she really was, and how she could be in the world uh, by actually going on her adventure. And so it's deceptive because things can seem to go well from this protective place. But the origin story shows us what was happening. While Wakanda was thriving and protected, their African brothers and sisters were being taken into bondage and into slavery. While Wakanda was isolated and thriving and protected, the world wars were happening. As Wakanda was thriving and being protected, nuclear weapons were being developed and being used on this planet. It has unintended consequences because while Wakanda was being protected and isolated, we had the, the radicalization, as it said in the movie, of, of Prince Njobu. Because he realized this is not right. Something's not right here. We need to get vibranium to our people. And then, of course, while Prince T'Challa is being groomed to become the king, young Eric Stevens is being groomed to become Killmonger. And so we have to ask ourselves, when we look at our origin stories and we justify why we are living in a protected way or while we're just staying in the familiar way. And it has some benefits. We must acknowledge that. But are there some unintended consequences? Because we see King T'Chaka was living in a certain way, protecting Wakanda. And so the unintended consequences, he killed his brother and left his nephew abandoned because he needed to protect and isolate Wakanda. Now, in The Power of Myth, in the, in the first episode, um, The Hero's Adventure, which I just mentioned, Joseph Campbell talks about, in, in Western mythology, we have these stories of the dragons, right? That you gotta slay a dragon, or many times in the story, the dragon is sitting in a cave and protecting something, right? It's a pot of gold, or there's some jewels, or the, the, the dragon may have a princess or a goddess that's um, can't get out because the dragon is there. And so you, the hero of the story uh, goes on the quest, goes on the adventure to slay the dragon. And what he says there is that in the, in the hero's adventure, in this idea, the symbol of the dragon, it represents greed. And it also represents hoarding because it's not making use of the gold. Gold is wonderful, but gold is not designed to just sit, right? We're supposed to exchange our currency. We're supposed to circulate our currency. Similarly, a, a beautiful woman is wonderful and beautiful not to just objectify and look at, right, but to understand that, that she's a powerful, um, wonderful person, human being that is beneficial to society, right? She's not supposed to just sit there, right, being protected. But we recognize that this is what that dragon represents. And so as we have that in those stories, this is what's happening with Wakanda. Wakanda is being protected by a dragon that needs to be slayed. And thankfully, our dear brother T'Challa, he's already come through an experience in civil war, and this is why he's able to make the choices that he makes in the Black Panther movie. If he had not gone through that process in the belly of the whale of recognizing that, oh, avenging my father, and I recognize now that the energy of vengeance is not the place that I want to live in, there's no way that he could have understood Eric Stevens. There's no way he could have understood Killmonger. There's no way that he could have even, at the very last minute, he still was trying to save his life. Because he knew and understood where he was. And so we have this wonderful uh, a phase of the hero's journey. We talked about the three acts of the hero's journey. There's the departure, initiation, and then the return. And so here's where we find T'Challa in the return, and it's described like this by Joseph Campbell. The trick in returning is to retain the wisdom gained on the quest, to integrate that wisdom into human life, and then maybe figure out how to share the wisdom with the rest of the world. So again, as I said, T'Challa was already bringing wisdom from the Civil War movie, from that experience. He's bringing that with him, and he's been crowned king of Wakanda. But then some new information comes, and he is made known in an interesting way. He's made known of his first cousin, Eric Stevens. And of course, he eventually comes to Wakanda, and because of his birthright, he now challenges him for the throne, and we see 
King T'Challa thrown off the edge. And we're led to believe that he's dead, right? And so in that experience, something happens, right? He's rescued by M'Baku and the Jabari tribe. But not only is he rescued, but then he's restored and he's healed by his mother, Ramonda, his sister, Shuri, and his lover, Nakia. Now this is a powerful symbolism. And when you read Camp Campbell, you'll see this always happens. That in that place of, of uh, the return, uh, many times the character or the hero of the story doesn't want to return or isn't able to return. Something, someone has to help him return. And it's always, because of this return, you're supposed to be different when you come back, it's always a goddess or a fairy or the feminine that shows up. Because we recognize that birth only happens through the feminine, right? So that's why it's a beautiful scene when you have Ramonda, Shuri, and Nakia standing around him. They've given him the herb, and then they're speaking praise to the ancestors, praise to the ancestors, praise to the ancestors. What that symbol is, it's symbolizing this beautiful path that the goddess or the feminine is the thing that helps us and gives birth to the new life. And so as he then takes the herb and he goes into that wonderful transcendent realm, his father greets him and says, the time has come for you to come home and be re reunited with me. And so he has a choice at that point. And this is the, the thing, as, as we just talked about from Campbell, the trick in returning is to retain the wisdom gained on the quest, to integrate that wisdom in the human life, and then maybe figure out how to share the wisdom with the rest of the world. And so his father said, come home. It's time to be re reunited with us and all of your ancestors. And he could have stayed there because this ancestral realm is beautiful. And there's no pain, there's no suffering, none of those things are there. He could be free of all the problems and not have to deal with the, the weight of being a king and the weight of what's facing him if he goes back having to, again, challenge uh, Eric Stevens or Killmonger. But he makes a choice and he has an argument with his father and asks him questions about why did he leave the boy? And so in that moment, in that conversation, he refuses to follow in his father's footsteps. He chooses to make a new choice because he's gained some wisdom when he was in the belly of the whale. He gained some wisdom as he moved through this path and he's saying now, I have the opportunity to share this wisdom with the rest of the world, or in this case with Wakanda. I have the opportunity to, to live differently and to be differently as a king. And so he chooses to return, he chooses to come forth, he chooses to come back. And now he's emboldened, and now he's empowered. He's the Black Panther again, and of course he faces Eric Stevens, and he wins. But it doesn't end there. And here's the opportunity for us in our lives. Because many of you, I'm sure, have made different choices, made new choices, gone through an experience and said, eh, this is how my parents did it, or this is how my family did it, or this is how people that look like me did it. I'm going to do something different. And you made the choice, just as King T'Challa has made in this story, to no longer isolate and protect Wakanda, but understand that Wakanda and all of its brilliance and greatness is protected because it exists. You don't have to protect your brilliance. Now, it's interesting because the master teacher, Jesus, he spoke to this very thing. He put it this way. We have Matthew 13. I'm just about done. Matthew 13 through 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So as you take yourself through the journey of the story of Wakanda, recognize that the opportunity is not to hide. In the same way as, as Jesus says here so clearly, you would not light a lamp and hide it under the bushel basket, um, but you would put it on the lampstand to give light to all the house. Wakanda represents the best of us. 
Wakanda represents the possibility of how great we can be on the planet. Wakanda represents the opportunity or the reality that there is, is, is gold within us. We have gold mines, that's a literal truth. Um, but it, rep it represents this idea that we are all geniuses, that we all have the capability, probability, and possibility to live great, to be great, to do great, to have great things, and to let that legacy live on. But you cannot hide your light. You are the light of the world. Shine your light. I love even the first part when we look at you are the salt of the earth, but the salt has, if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? When we hide ourselves in the same way that Wakanda hid itself, it's like cooking chicken and not putting salt on it. Okay. <laughs> and so we're walking around here with a bland world, an unseasoned world. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and he realized that and so that's why we have that powerful speech in the UN where he, he then realizes and recognizes even though they didn't know who he was just as the world doesn't know how powerful you are the world doesn't know how brilliant you are you show up in the UN in consciousness and you say I'm going to give my gifts I'm going to present who and what I am I'm going to share because I recognize we are one tribe and we are one people and I recognize that we are stronger together than we are apart we now embody the very same idea in consciousness that T'Challa embodied because the world needs some salt y'all. Oh my God, it literally needs salt. And so, as you affirm Wakanda forever, as you go home today and watch the movie, how many people are going to go watch the movie? <laughs> Two people texted me yesterday saying they were going to watch the movie yesterday and prep for today. As you go home and watch the movie and you're excited and you're proud and you affirm Wakanda forever, recognize that every time you do that, it's like sprinkling salt on the world, on this unseasoned, unsavory world. And so with that, I invite everybody to stand. And we take a deep breath in and we breathe out. And we breathe in and we breathe out. Mother, Father, God, we stand here now recognizing the truth that all the brilliance, all the boldness, all the glory that is represented in this imaginary country called Wakanda, so that glory, that brilliance, that magnificence, it resides in, through, and as us. For we recognize that we are divine beings, we are holy beings. We recognize that there is vibranium flowing all through us in the same way that there's vibranium flowing all through Wakanda. And so as we recognize this, we no longer hide ourselves under a bushel. We no longer isolate or protect ourselves, but we recognize that there is something here for us to do. We recognize that the world needs seasoning and we're the salt. And so we pray this prayer, if you can use anything, Lord, use me. Take my hands and my feet, touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, you can use me. We present our bodies, we present our lives, we present our minds, we present our genius, we present our talents, we present our treasure, we present all that we are in the same way that Wakanda is being presented in this film, in this story. So we now present ourselves because the world is calling for us. All the unwanted problems, all of the challenges, all of the difficulties that we see on our planet, it's calling out for Wakanda, and we are Wakanda. As we affirm Wakanda forever, we are affirming our glory forever. We are affirming our greatness forever. We are affirming our brilliance forever. We are affirming our good forever. We are affirming our capability forever. We are affirming our promise forever. We are affirming our divinity forever. And for this truth, I am so very grateful. I now release this prayer back into the law, back into the atmosphere. This law that is always in operation, responding to our words, organizing itself around these words right here and right now. We let it be. We let it be so. And to that we say, amen. Amen. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. So it is. And so it is. Thank you, God.